lovely to see you again. Um, before we go into talking about the relationship with our space, and we have some images from the gallery to show everybody. And I had some questions coming in. Um, I'm going to just hand to Robert because you know my work and you've known me for well over 30 years now, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, what can I say? Um, uh, when I first started at um, uh, Southeast Arts Board, as it was, and you were on the board, uh, I seem to remember. And um, Community Arts was working under advisory. Right. And uh, I, I remember coming to your studio um, and getting the introduction to the textile world, really, I guess. You know, I, I, I'd been at college and I lived with uh, fashion people and stuff like that and made my own uh, garments, etc. and been interested in textiles from a fashion angle. But then when I got introduced to your work, it was more art textiles or whatever. Uh, um, and then, as you know, then I went on to be a crafts officer at um, uh, Southeast Arts and um, and funded a lot of um, textile exhibitions. So I've kept up that that that, that contact with the textile world uh, with uh, people like Leslie Miller, uh, mm. who, who, who you know, and Francis Geeson, pe people like people like that, you know, kind of old friends now. Um, so so yeah. So I don't know. Did I invite you to? Do the exhibition, or did you? In, did you? Yeah, you know, I think it was mutual. You had you had contacted me a few years ago and said you'd like me to exhibit, and then you'd seen some of this um, feed that I'd been given about this development work I was doing, um, places, spaces, and traces, and invite. I said, could we talk about that? Would you like to come to Ireland? And uh, you know, here I am virtually, and I'll cover that a little bit in the talk. But I was delighted because I felt like um, I'd come home, if you like. That's where I started, is working in the community, establishing my name as a because I trained as a painter. You'd seen what I was doing as a painter who worked in textiles. And it was like somebody rubber stamped, you know, it's that final rubber stamp. I'd gone full circle. Somebody who I'd respected, seen the work and just wanted it elsewhere. And, it, you know, this this is about that risk taking where a project will gather momentum. Um, and I think it's what is positive about that uncertainty in arts, particularly at the moment, that has always existed in my world, is that sometimes in order to be creative, we have to be uncertain. We have to lose the perfect. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to try now, excuse me, everybody, to spotlight or pin myself. OK, so this is the exhibition in our space. It started in LV21, and I'm hoping to share a video, which has just come to me this week, of it in On Light Vessel 21. And... In the corner there, you can see there's a table set up, which is part of the community response to this work, which is called the shipping forecast, and to the idea of what the things we value and the things we miss. So I'll cover that a little bit more later in the talk. But part of the shipping forecast originated um, at least 218 when I heard um, a BBC broadcast at recorded that um, 17,700 migrants had lost their lives in the waters of Europe in the time span between 2014 and 2018. Heaven knows how many have since lost their lives in the last four years. And it got me thinking about where I stood. Um, I am, I'm of Romani heritage, so I'm of an itinerant or fam, a traveling background. And I believe that many people move or migrate or um, you can see what's happening at the moment with um in 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 with russia and um bought, all this thing to do with borders is that they move for a variety of reasons to escape persecution to consider i've got three people in the waiting room so i'm just going to let them in so this is the space and um, for those of you who are zooming in from all over the world, it's with great courage and tenacity that we managed to get this exhibition there and support from our space itself. Um, I, talk, I was just talking about how in, with migration, people are looking to um, find a better life for themselves better, um, at, at the very least. 
but often escaping persecution, they become economic migrants. And without migration, um, certainly some of the, um, our National Health Service wouldn't have survived, I don't think, or we needed them for farming. So this question about a migrant or a traveler or somebody coming into your country, there are questions about why we have borders and what our role is in supporting communities. And conversely, in the last two years, many of us have had our lives constrained in much the same way some migrants are because they don't have passports at times or they're traveling illegally. We've been told where we can go, what we can do, how far we can travel, whether we have to stay at home. And with part of that, there are questions about what we value and what we miss. I cannot within this within this show, I am restricted to seeing it on the screen. As much as I'd love to be in Ireland, my personal circumstances have changed. And within the talk, I don't mind sharing this. Uh, my partner had a stroke um, in the latter part of last year, and he's still in recovery. So again, I'm limited to how I can travel. But what I have been able to do is to develop those connections virtually. And I'm making more choices about what's important to me to participate in these days and how I can still be an active member of my community with the same restrictions that I recognize many of us face through a variety of reasons. You know, we might be having to stay at home because we are um, in a position where we're more vulnerable. It could be that our work demands us to do that. So uh, our idea of where we're positioned in the world has been changed, I think, quite a lot in the last two years. So it seems very apt that this exhibition is in Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, I believe that's where uh, nearly over 100 years ago, um, Belfast was one of the great shipping communities and also a place where migrants left for the new world. Um, so these kind of questions about that transition, that layer of meaning is layered through the textiles. And in fact, um, Pamela Whitaker asked me about the significance of how I layer my fabrics and textures. And I think that cloth carries meaning. And the bits that I collect in transients, the pieces that I'm given, carry with them the voices of the people who gave them to me or the history that's connected to them. And they're fragments that maybe are not of great value. They sometimes are picked up um, off the street. And many of these I picked up in Dover and Folkestone on, on, on the um, beach. So um, you can hazard a guess where they might have come from. Some of the linens came from Antwerp, who have asked me to exhibit there in two years' time. Um, some of the pieces in the gallery that you are working on have been donated via um, our space. So when I look at these pieces and the layers within them, I don't just see the cloth. I actually see the hands that have passed them to me and the fact that cloth is something that's very intimate to us. That's the reason I enjoy working with cloth, that it has that quality of being touched by hand. And... Um, Light as part of the work, it's that subtlety we have. We're used to seeing that separation of cloth between our windows and our outdoor spaces so that it allows light in, but it doesn't allow people to peek in or blinds that allow us a view outside. Um, so it's about that covering, what we choose to cover and what we choose to reveal, you know, including our bodies, you know, the fact that cloth has that very intimate connection. Um, and if I make it, a, a connection to my earlier history. When we paint, we paint in layers so that the colors shine through. So second book, um, la, paint, uh, Textile Landscape, its subtitle was painting with cloth, not on cloth. I was often questioned that. Why don't you use the term on cloth? Because I, I treat cloth as a vehicle, like you would oil paint or watercolor. It's that loaded pigment, but it has its own texture that it brings to it. And the very fact, which is quite clear in these images, you can see not just the physical or tangible parts of the cloth that have gone into this piece, um, but also you see the colors that have been used to change some of the surfaces using, I use natural daylight and silk dyes to get these transient marks onto the surfaces and many of those surfaces. 
and the capacity it has to change when the light hits it. So that now appear, they now appear much denser. These pieces are perhaps at some, sometimes double layers. So there's one cloth overlaying another where they overlap and at other times single layers. They're made out of um, linen, muslin, um, there's some scrim and bandages that I've been given. There are pieces of clothing and napkins. And some of those were sent to me from all over the world. As I said, others I've picked up or when I was allowed to travel and do workshops, they were given to me in workshops. So I never knew what components would be used in the next piece until I started to bring it together. And I don't need to be certain about that at that time. I like to say, what if? You will notice there are stitched words on, the, on those pieces and they echo some of the comments that I heard over the news, also whilst traveling on trains, you know, listening to and um, seeing what's on the newspaper, picking up the headlines, why would that be the case? Well, hopefully we'll have a closer look um, at some of that text in a little while, but headings such as um, 17,700 migrants lost their lives on the waters of Europe. Um, 40 lost their lives on Christmas Day traveling. So these were like sound bites that were there to um, capture our attention. But when you walk through the piece, initially, I want people not to find out, sorry about this connection, this is some of the work in progress for what we value. I want people to be able to read the text that's relevant to them. So I loved this, which it said, I started out at 6 a.m. It took me three train journeys to get here. It was well worth the effort. I'm leaving a crochet chain linking us all. Thank you, Veronica. So it's our immediate response translated into these works, but also my response to the text, which is this image shows quite clearly on the back, the text becomes illegible. It's recognizable as text, but it's not the first thing that you see. And it clearly shows the layers of layers through the light coming through it. And the marks of the shipping for or, or the weather patterns overlaid over the top, the one other element that holds it together. So it's this um, recognition that language is often hidden from us. What people might be saying to us is often hidden because we don't have an understanding of language. What's layered, what we take for granted about what we hear and what we see in our opinion isn't always clear to us um, in translation. And that meeting point between one person and another, one piece of cloth and another, that uncertainty coming through the work is, is quite important to me that it, well, I want to leave space for people to make up their own mind about the work. One of the pieces that started this many years ago was within Kent Life Museum. Kent, I'm not certain if anybody knows that, one of the biggest um, um, ethnic minority groups in Kent are actually Romani and Gypsy communities. Um, I, I, as I said, I, am, I, I have Romani heritage. And this is called Hopkins. And there are images of hops stitched onto the surface. And it's my face or my portrait um, represented in all four pieces. In the original exhibition, these were hung in hoppers huts. Um, and this is where um, the hop pickers and the East Enders used to go. And my great grandmother and my grandmother would have gone there during hop picking time to pick the hops. And obviously, more recently, fruit pickers, strawberry pickers and farm workers have come from the Eastern Bloc because it was cheaper labour. They were the cheaper labour of the time. So we always um, make that connection to the land through the labourers who work it. And those labourers at one time were transient or needed to be transient because you don't need labour on the land full time. So that's always been the connection we have to our landscape and to our working communities. And again, what we see here, but looking at the bottom of the piece, that's a, pe uh, that's a tape, uh, tea towel from my grandmother's and some of the um, yellow fabric on that piece are my grandmother's dresses. So 
paper just torn and cut up and, and repositioned. It was a fragile life. I mean, my grandmother reminded me when she um, was working on the fields that the older community lived in the huts and the, and the um, young youngsters went and lived in the benders. And they were originally the shelters that were made out of local plant material because it was summer that they wouldn't normally live in before they had caravans when they traveled the the um roads for millennia to find work um the uh, the novelty of the horse and car came quite late into the traveling communities of the gypsies you know they didn't necessarily have horse and cart to begin with they'd pull their belongings on a car and worked from um farm to farm so that romantic vision we have of them living in caravans is part of that, that nature of time passing. Um, and certainly most of them will live in, in motorised caravans today as opposed to horse and carts. Can you imagine trying to take a horse and cart along the M25 in Kent now? So that idea that this work is heavily rooted in and making connection to my own ancestry and indeed the the seeds for this project started when I was invited to make an exhibition with the Romani Cultural and Arts Company. And I started to think about not just my own narrative heritage, but the heritage um, and history of many traveling communities and migrants. So, and it's the edges of the cloth I see as being fragile and torn and battered. Um, and I, that's always been a quality within my work, that honesty to the materials that I've gathered, that they have been found, and that the weathered clothing certainly represents that fragility that we see within the landscape around us, how it moves and changes. So there was a connection there within the nature of the materials. So here you can see there's the word stored away, so you know, part of the shipping forecast. Um, and then um, some, again, some stencils. These stencils were made out of um, copper um, stencils that were used to mark the crates and containers that were on the shipping, on the ships before they were now digitalized. So my father was a sign writer and I remember that's one of the jobs he did when he was a national serviceman, was marking crates that were coming in um, when serving in um, Korea. So that the idea that we've always been a land, a land surrounded by water, and we're very aware of the fragility of 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 the coastal um, areas of our of our landscape. So, this is two years ago now. Wash your hands, maintain social distancing, stay at home while the steps have. While these steps have disrupted our everyday lives, they're simple and generally easy to follow. For most refugees, however, they're impossible. This was Megan Spencer in The Standard. And that kind of hit home to me that, that I live in a, in a little terrace house with a nice little garden at the back. And I can wash my hands reasonably easy and I can close my door and make myself safe against COVID. But if you're stuck in a camp and you've got easy access to water or you're walking the streets or in fact you're homeless and you're living on the streets, those means, the means to protect yourself and follow those directions that we were all given were certainly not easy to follow. And these were the, again another layer of risk that's thrown at people who do not have a place that they can call home. So we take it for granted, this nature of what we call home. And if you look, you can see that that's part of a child's dress. Just see the outlines swing, swimming through the, the, the isobars. And this was the Times. It was a cartoon on December the 9th, 2019. EU migrants, this country does not need you. So. All of, all of that time, I was underlying all of these headlines that were meant to inflame, grab our attention. What I was hearing from people that I call friends was the, the, their uncertainty about what was happening, but their empathy and sympathy with those who were caught in this maelstrom of both COVID crisis, 
having no place to live and actually just wanting to live their lives. So, I, you know, what these things might have a confliction of opinion, but that's where we sit. That's where humanity sits. You know, we want to protect our jobs in brackets. We want to um, have a life that's certain, but we've spent the last two years having to deal with that uncertainty ourselves. So send them back. Imagine, feel, ha, imagine having that presented to you, that you've spent your life to dedicating your life here in Britain, working with the NHS or working on a farm, and you, you're suddenly at some point being told you're not welcome anymore, or why are you here? And then as we go through, you'll see that the... the, the how we work through that. There was a question somebody asked me about this innate imperfection, sense of acceptance and the celebration of life's imperfection. And I think this work for me is about that imperfection. I don't seek perfection in my work. I seek movement. I seek the idea of transience within how the pieces are held together. I, I remember having a conversation with another textile artist about why they stretched their work over a canvas and they said it made them more commercially viable. People like things squared up and framed. And I, I thought you're almost denying that textile, but that's often the corporate world of art saying, you know, telling us that the work has to have this finish to it. And I like that hand to be left in my, in my pieces because we are imperfect beings. And that's what I'm wanting to communicate generally within my work that any line that I intend to put in there, that's the thing that maybe is, has a little bit more certainty. It's there because of the, what it's saying, that it has that movement within it. And failure, it, it happens all the time in my work. And how do we turn that around? I think we just have to embrace it. Um, without failure, and I, I'm talking about it both with a capital F and a small f, I think artists learn the most when something doesn't go right, because then you push through it you really put, try to push through it. And I never really start a piece with an idea of what it's going to be looking like. I might have lots of ideas jotted down, but I find my way through it as I work with the piece. So I, I embrace that, that, again, I use that word uncertainty, the sense of saying um, in uncertainty, failure, um, the liminal world between where one, where textile meets painting. I find my way through it. And I think that, that for me is the world of expression and fine art as opposed to this gloss that we've had within our last 20 years of some of the arts work that I've seen developed, that it has this kind of, I almost think, polish and finish that I find unacceptable in my own practice. I tend to... You might hear it in my voice. I talk from the heart. I never. I start these talks saying what I want to, what I'm what trying to embrace. But as I look through the work, and these shots have been taken by our space. Thank you, our space. So as I'm looking at them, the work is coming back to me afresh, and I'm seeing other things in it. And I think that's where I'd like you to look at the pieces. You being able to embrace it with your own stories, your own narratives. Um, and if I'm looking at that lace in the middle there, that little doily, I think of, you know, I can then think about my grandmother and how she'd have these things on her milk jug. So you're embracing my grandmother's milk jug and how she would protect the milk from going off or flies landing in it by keeping it in a cool place and putting these doilies over the top that had weights on them. And her tea was always served on a tray that had these lace doilies that her great great grandmother made. She she kind of turned her back on textile. She nobody taught me to stitch. She just wasn't going to go down that road. And in the way that the pieces are positioned so that in each venue they will take take up a, a the space that they're surrounded by um you'll see later in on the ship it had a they, they were subtly different because i think like clothing we put on has different sizes or we decorate our homes with the furnishings we have around them us whilst these might have their own the core of their meaning within the pieces that layering the subject matter 
they continue to tell a different story depending on the environment they relate to, how the light comes through, how they relate to the shadows falling on the walls or the floors, the timing of the day, the physical dimensions of that space will add its own quality to the work. This is certainly something I learned from Leslie Miller when I worked with her for the, um, a Japanese installation about 20 years ago, how textiles take up space in a different way other types of work can, like sculpture, depending on its narrative, because it can fold into its space. It, it can unfold, it can move. The figures, if somebody's wondering, are actually of my family, but I call them all family because they're from, I know they're my family, but it doesn't matter that you don't know that. I think the faces, I felt very strongly, I couldn't use faces just pulled off the newspaper or take photographs of migrants and use them. I knew I could use these because I had ownership of them, but I think poignantly they kind of read back to me on a personal level. At the same time, they're anyone's faces. They have that kind of old quality from the black and white photographs I've taken. And they also remind me that 100 years ago, we faced another pandemic. There's my grandmother masked up there, great grandmother. So recently we had an International Migrants Day and throughout human history, migration has been a courageous expression of the individual's will to overcome adversity and live a better life. That's um, the United Nations. And that's how I tend to think about migra migration. We all want a better life for ourselves. We want a place to live, somewhere where we can protect our family, we can grow food. That's what most people want in life. So these pieces are made on my grandmother's cloths, tape, um, napkins. And she talked about how the road she traveled with, the fields would sustain her, the trees gave her shelter, and they could gather food and medicines along the route. Um, to a certain extent, I remember that. Um, I have witch hazel growing in my front garden at the moment, a symbolic of that. It's one of, it has strong, powerful qualities. And most of our medicines today are st still come from plant deriv you know, um, derivatives. That's where they come from. Um, but we need to sustain that world that we live in as well. Um, and indeed, some people only have the, the shelter of trees along the, on, along the road today that they're traveling along to get from one place to another. Um, but the regular routes I took through my local park during the pandemic, uh, that footpath that I tra trod most days and every day, I became f more familiar with the, the changing seasons and following that through. So as, as travelers in the world, we need to pay attention to that world around us. And these are part of me paying attention to that world. That world is the thing that sustains me. And empty vessels. This actually started as a keep busy piece at the beginning of 220, when my mind was in turmoil, when I lost all the work and I think that's echoed through many people who work in the creative industries and within, within um, hospitality, that we saw everything that we'd planned. We, I mean, work, um, work is planned or exhibitions are planned years ahead. But all of the work that I had planned for the few months at, the t at that time, we thought we were in lockdown, let alone what we've been facing for the last two years, just dry up. Um, you know, it felt like my blood had congealed in my veins. I thought, what am I going to do? I was in panic mode. But then my, what was I was going through was happening to everybody, you know, where we were going, what we were doing. Um, and so I, I made these out of the waste bits from those larger pieces and incorporated pages from newspapers. And um, um, I wrapped them around some... Um, little cups, coffee cups, and other cups I had, and plastic cups from which water was given to some of the migrants. I actually went down and helped out for a couple of days when I could, um, giving out tea and coffee and, and, and water to people that were coming over to our shores. And I have worked with people at our local adult education centre who have come to study English as a second language. And I think back to the fact that the first thing that people need is water or 
Churchill, for example, said one of the things that he protected were the convoys of tea that kept us going during the Second World War. How important it is to have something um, in our hands as a symbolic gesture of passing one thing from one human to another to say, I'm helping. This is what you need. This is the very least I can do. And these are fragile, and each one has been held together with stitches. In fact, I really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed how Space has interpreted um, this on the Facebook page. I do you know, do visit it and see what people have had to say um, about these pieces. What they've had to say about these pieces. So they were cut or torn from the containers they were wrapped around, they were molded around them and then restitched back together to hold the um, hold them together. And while they are small, empty vessels, I, I also make that connection to those vessels that people are traveling across um, our shores and, and waterways around mm -hmm. Europe, how fragile they are and how what they, the people that they carry. Um, and again, I think this perfectly exemplifies how they're sitting in, in another space. The light of the window is creating another dimension to these pieces. They respond to those shadows and reflections coming through that window. I'd love to be there in person, but um, thank you to our space for taking such beautiful shots of these works, which somehow transfers their fragility. And I like the fact they appear to be floating in that space. Couldn't be a more apt way of showing them. So in, this is what isn't on show at the moment in the gallery, but this is something that the gallery is working towards. And it's a project that I've set, I set up at the beginning of the pandemic called What We Value, What We Miss. And I asked the question, with the closing of borders, the world stays at home. The time, this time is particularly poignant as we maintain social distancing during the pandemic. Never has the world seemed so silent at the sound of hum, human mov, movement as during spring 220. The connection we have to landscape and place is at the heart of my work. And the question, what we value, what we miss, formed the basis of research for an exhibition, Places, Spaces, Traces, which first had its roots at Gypsy Maker 4. Um, this was an exhibition that reflected my life and my connection to my Romani heritage. And conversely, it was grounded because of the pandemic, which was ironic considering it was about itinerant workers and movers and the gypsy community. And I asked a question at the beginning, prior to the pandemic, because the first exhibition did run in, in Wales, of identity in place. And what would you bring with you if you were forced to leave your home and you could only carry enough things in a backpack? And what would you miss from what you, what you had to leave behind? And I felt that they were echoes of what we were missing, the things we took for granted, like going on holiday, seeing old friends, having a cup of tea or a coffee in a cafe. What are those things that we miss? And they have equal resonance in the times that we find ourselves. And I started a... Um, project online and I have a closed group called what we miss what we value um, in response to this exhibition and I again it seeded some of the work and how I was thinking about taking it further with the shipping forecast and the work that's in our space so Crossroads is a group in Antwerp this exhibition that's in our space will go to Antwerp and these are some of our a couple of pieces here in response to that theme. So they were stitching down flowers and they all used the same blue and white um, napkins or handkerchiefs for their work. And when the work translates to Antwerp in the summer, it's going to be in a big church with a basement and the shipping forecast will go in the basement because it has this feel of a, um, the working areas of the ship. But in the church itself will be some of my work and some of these pieces which follow that, that term, what we miss, what we value. And again, I'm not certain how we're going to hang them yet. I just have faith they will come together. So there's much the scream reinterpreted there. And walking with a friend. And what's really important um, with the response to that idea is that taking the seeds of, of those words and 
the transient nature of what I do, I have no control and choose to have no control over how people present their own work. Uh, I think it's important in community work that people have their own voice. You might maybe set some parameters within which you operate, but how people record that is up to them so that their voice can come through that work or through the project. So the um, development of this, and I see again that what I do is always being in transient, that this is its stopping place at the moment at our space. This is what it looks like now, but what will it become when it gets to Antwerp? How will that installation change? And how will these responses from the community to, to the, that, that question, what we miss, what we value, um, be seen as, it's, as it reveals itself in this new space in, in the summer in the church? Um, so that responses could have been, these are examples, um, a treasured flower and plant. One young man I spoke to recently talked of missing his grandmother's garden and the roses in Iran. Everyday household things. So here the hugs, hugs us, hugs are by um, uh, an Australian colleague and friend of mine, Ches Atkin, and that's what she missed the most. I think we could all share with that. And Gail Mercer here, um, she's, she's, she was looking at her grandmother's chair um, and Amy Ru Mini, Mimi Rubin is looking at photographs of her garden and the things that are changing. So these are things that she values. We've all had to question those things in the last two, year, two years. So Debbie Carter misses her mother. Ellie Stewart has missed tea with friends. Leslie Coles are looking at how she values bird songs and every, the everyday things. Um, there's a piece by Elizabeth... Um, Words there, and I don't speak Dutch, so she might have to share that back with me. But Yoki Blom has missed her newborn grandson who was born. So these things are what migrants might miss about their families they're left behind, their relatives, their sense of place. Nobody leaves home or leaves the place they call home lightly. And during the before lockdown, these were some of the pieces that were made in response to that one exhibition that were made during the Gypsy Maker. And that's really sowed the seeds for this work. So somebody was, had written that they were making the memories for the future. The, this, these were homeless, well, I was working with a homeless charity and many of the people who were homeless were actually migrants. And you can see there's one there from myself and Derek. We've, and the garden. And I think Derek missed his garden for the nine weeks he was in hospital. His bed is positioned so it overlooks the garden. And just this morning while I was pruning, I, I, I've heard of backseat driver. He was a backseat gardener telling me how I should be pruning, um, which was quite good fun. Um, but each time I look at these by Pam Buck and Isabel Moore, I feel that, there is a dialogue or a narrative with, with the stitch that's coming through. And, and another part of the exhibition is um, contributions being through a colleague and friend, Fiona Doubleday, 52 Stitch Stories. She developed a project called 52 Stitch Stories in response to my book, The Stitch, Stitch Stories. She kind of borrowed the title and her community worked for 52 weeks to make postcards based on the stories they wanted to tell. And we had a discussion and she lives in Arran, Isle of Arran, off the west coast of Scotland. So her community have made their own piece in response to what we miss, what we valued, a community piece. Um, and that will go to Antwerp as well, a story cloth of our time. Um, and as she says quite poignantly, our connection with the sea provides a small lens through which to try and contemplate what it must be like to get into a small overcrowded boat and try to cross one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. We want our piece to record and speak the stories that are often ignored or even lost for forever. Um, I'm still amidst this time, as with everybody else. I'm going to stop share. And... This is an opportunity for you to ask questions. I think that 
I'm not certain if we, it looks like we have a few in chat. So I'm wondering if these could be shared with me and I could have a look. But I'm, I would welcome people asking me questions directly if you want to unmute yourself. Um, you might, I, I may not be able to see the hands going up. So we'll just see if it comes a free for all. But before I do that, um, I want to return to Robert um, and LV and the like um, our space gallery. Are there any things that you wouldn't want to add to this? That, that, that was that, that was so emotional and uh, uh, revealing, uh, even for me, knowing your work and knowing your practice um, and what you talk about touches touches so close. Uh, I, I do feel really emotional at the moment. Uh, and thank you for that, Kaz, to remind us about being human beings again. Absolutely. Uh, there was something that just briefly came up in chat, and I'm going to ask Lisbeth if she minds unmuting herself and saying it directly, because I think it just glanced up on my screen. And before we take the questions, Lisbeth, would you mind doing that for me, please? Would you unmute yourself and tell us about that piece on your handkerchief? Because that really works well with Robert. I'm sorry we're treating this informally, because I think you've just got it right, Robert. It's about being human and making that connection across the screen rather than being a kind of a stiff talk. You know, I've let you into my world where I am now. And some of what I said might have been a little bit kind of muddled, but that's really where I am with with my situation here. But that's being honest. So, let's yeah. share that, please. I'm going to spotlight you. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm going to add the spotlight because we've been good colleagues and friends. And uh, yes, we have across Zoom, haven't we? Zoom land. OK, yes. <laughs> with me. You mean an, expl an explanation about the quote? Yes, please. Yes. Ik was al groot, ik was al twaalf. That's what my sister said when we were playing as children. She was younger than me. She was about five years old. I was about seven years old. And we were playing grown-ups. And we thought 12 was really a grown-up. So that, that quote has stuck in my mind forever because now I'm uh, almost 50. And 12 doesn't seem too grown up to me anymore, but that is still my sister and me as children. And I miss her a lot during lockdown, but she lives in Amsterdam and I don't, so I always miss her. And um, yeah, so that was even worse in lockdown. And now we have a little bit more freedom in the Netherlands, but now she has COVID, so. Oh, yeah. And there was one yeah. quote you did on, which was on that big installation piece, which when I put the shipping forecast on later, people will see the other side of it. But the idea of near and far, would you translate that for me, please? Do you remember you gave us a quote about the idea of you miss, sometimes you want to travel, the idea of traveling away and you want to be home, which is something I always talk about as a, artist who works used to travel and do a lot of work outside of the home when mm -hmm. i'm traveling i sometimes want to be in a home in my home and when i so there's a there's a there are dutch words for that as well would you share that because i think they're very poignant what how they translate it the, the, uh, you mean the the two german words german words sorry yeah. it's heimweh that's yeah. um uh, when you are away and yeah. you're aching for a home so that's the the the, the pain you feel uh, homesickness, uh, it, it's, it's literally, but there's all, also in German you have fernweh, and that's the pain you feel when, when you want to be somewhere else. So the very romantic idea of not being where you are, but uh, wanting to be where you are not. Yeah, so absolutely. that's uh, the fernweh, far away, uh, uh, the hurt of not being far away, and heimweh, and in Dutch it's called heimweh as well, so that's the same. Yeah. yeah. But they're like they. I like the seesaw of those words and how how they how phonetically they're written, you know, near and far. Thank you, Lisbeth. Thank you. Okay, the first question came from Ruth Oppenheim. Um, how do you hang? Or how do you work with the free hanging pieces that must be two sided? And do you fuse the two pieces together? They they are fused, but not with any. Um, standard fusing materials. Um, I, I use a lot of materials and media that I use come from the painting world. 
So I use lightweight, I use paste to hold them together temporarily and they hang through a slot at the top. I just find the simplest solution for that. And a lot of the ways that um, I work with my materials are explained through all my publications. So yeah, it's just hang, hung on a simple dowel or rod at the top. And when it goes to Antwerp, they're going to be using some industrial metal materials, which are in keeping with the, um, uh, the um, basement, the boiler room, where they're going to hang of the church, which is also a gallery. It's also a gallery. It's not just that, but I just love this huge metal heating system that goes through that seems very appropriate for it to be in that space. Uh, the next question is from Janet, and she asks, how do you transfer the images to fabric? And is there an easy way to do it from home? No, there isn't an easy way just basically to do it from home. I know that I, I think people will always recognise me for my honesty. Um, Janet, thank you for asking the question. Um, there are some materials, you, there are some things you can do more easily and you can buy iron on transfer paper. That's the easiest way to do it. And that's a propriety paper. And that's, um, but if anything's, I was told by my father, if anything's worth doing, it takes time, effort and a lot of hard work. Um, and I don't want a perfect image. So I'll use what's appropriate. And those ones used an oil painting transfer method and photocopies, which is incredibly messy, incredibly um, mercurial. Some work, some doesn't. But sometimes the ones that don't work, I like. And I like that. When somebody mentioned, how do I uh, slide into failure? A lot of the times I'm working in my studio, there's an awful lot of failure. But then I'm learning and that pushes it. If, it, if, if, any, if, if things become too easy, then I stop because nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to come out of it. So I never, I never use the word easy when I'm doing a workshop. I might use the word accessible. My, my approaches are accessible. Some of the methodologies that I use might be um, simple in brackets. You know, there, there are lots of little techniques or processes that I use. But in order to achieve that layering, that subtlety is incredibly hard, even for me. And um, at the moment, I'm trying to think through another project I want to work on and I never find it easy. So if it's easy, my argument is you're not doing it right. That's one thing that, uh, that comes through with the people come into the exhibition. They're all fascinated about how you do stuff. Yeah, and I have no secrets. Anybody who's worked with me, who's been on my workshops, yeah. tells, no, that there, there are no secrets. But yeah. um, and that's the brilliance of of you and sharing that 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 I don't know what, what, what freedom of just do it and then see what happens. Absolutely, but there are you know there are foundation things that happen within the piece, and I, it's, the reason I'm not can't give you a step by step is because. I will say I will talk you through it here and it will mean nothing unless you actually do it. But um, but yes. Yeah. I, I use oil an oil based. I, I, and I, the oil paints came out of a bin. So I, I kind of improvise because it falls within my remit of using what I have around me as much as possible because we produce too much waste in the world anyway. So whatever I can retrieve to use is part of the nature of the piece. But what's been what's been brilliant about the people who've been coming to see your your work, and some people have travelled, like you said, said six hours, you know, to get to 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 see your to see your work in the flesh, as it were, and that's and I mean this most sincerely. This is the uh, probably the first ex the real exhibition that people have have traveled to and taken care to look at your work and, and spend time in the space looking at your work. It's been, it's been overpowering for me, you know, because some people come in the gallery and they, they walk around, they look at the stuff and they go out, they go out. But yours, uh, people have stayed and they've contemplated the work and they've considered it and felt it, you know, that's that's what's been really important in this exhibition for me, Kaz. Well, well, thank you, Robert, because we knew we entered this from, I don't say, I say relative risk. I knew I was in safe hands and 
particularly where I am at the moment, I was, I'm part in mourning for not just the last two years. There's a part of me that celebrated what I've been able to do, but part in mourning for that interaction, you know, what, but also more so now because of my personal circumstances. I wouldn't have it any other way. Don't get me wrong, anybody. I wouldn't have it any other way, but I'm still finding my way that I can still be a viable member of the creative community. And it's through partnerships like our space. We said, okay, well, we've got that little bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge, but we can, we can get through that because we want this to happen. And that, that's where I've kind of realized, and a lot of people have said that to me, you've banked up a lot of credit in your life, Cass, so allow people to help you to, ha- to still get out there. And that, that partnership with I, our space and your validation of my work is where I cannot be there. I'm, it's as close as I can to be there. And I think our, should cut touch humanity it should make us it should make us feel something can i just interrupt just speaking of help we have a question from millie and she says that as a child her grandmother taught her to stitch or sew and she asks, do you have childhood memories of sewing no the only one that i have i have two one i'm going to reply because you asked me a question zara and the other one is the cross stitch apron. So some of us who live in the UK, and I'm certain it's carried elsewhere, we did home economics, didn't mind the cooking, even dropping the the shepherd's pie on the way home. But having to make this damn cross stitch apron before I could even get onto cooking, I never finished mine because I kept on picking it all the time. And I don't have a record of anybody teaching me to do any sewing at home. And that that actually could have put me off stitching for the rest of my life. But suddenly, when I was at art college, we had, uh, it was Maidstone College of Art then. And for some obscure reason, materials and equipment hadn't arrived for the first project. You get an induction project. So the project they devised for us was to use the old canvases that students had left over from the previous year. And they did have paint left over and we had to use that and somehow go outside, find a landscape and try to work on top and allow some of this other stuff to come through in a meaningful way. Quite an interesting project, actually. But I had this god awful canvas and every time I painted over the top, because my lack of my knowledge kept coming through. And in the end, I just got a Stanley knife and cut through it. And then I had this problem, this torn frayed canvas. And so I thought, how am I going to get it together? So I stitched it together. So this idea of destroying to create and using the needle to bring it together has never left my hand since. And that's really where I engage with the needle. And I think what I've learned through working in really hard slogging community arts, which is still the core of my practice about enabling people to have a voice, but subsequently working as a people with the Embroiderers Guild and the Quilters Guild got to see my work. And I really value what they offer to the community at large in this country and worldwide, they have a reputation worldwide, is that there is this side of textiles about perfection and following a line, because that's how it's taught, that to kind of take risks and destroy and kind of muddle up that territory a bit is a frightening area, you know, that and the most valid part of my creative process is at art college and taught me how to look, not how to make. It taught me how to look. It validated that drawing and observation is an incredibly important part of my process. And that's where your ideas come from. It doesn't, you could have thousands of techniques under the thumb. But as great Constance Howard said, you only need to know five stitches, but you need to know how to do them bloody well. So, you know, you don't need to have lots of techniques and processes because that that won't make your work unique it's what's in here and how you draw and how you respond to the world around you and that's what I'm passionate about whether it's a child coming out from school who's five years old and draws without without effort they shouldn't have that knocked out of them because it has to conform to some artificial framework. Susie says beautiful exhibition and then goes on to ask Was the motivation purely personal or did you intend that those viewing it would feel an emotive response to it? I don't have any ownership of your emotional response. All I have is how I'm honest about my own work. And it always surprises me how people respond or what they say. And some people get it and some people 
don't. And that's fine by me because I'm there to make the work I want to make. And if people want to respond to it and get an, a, a tangible physical response, then it's doing its job for some of the people. I don't expect everybody to like what I do, but I've got to my stage in life. I don't care if they don't like what I do. I'll still do it. OK, so I think you've maybe touched on this. Anne Dixon asks, can you talk a bit about the Scottish project, 52 Stitch Stories? Uh, what I'm going to do is gradually feed that in onto my web, web, um, website space. Um, I don't know if Fiona is actually in the audience. She may not be because she's a very busy lady. So I'll only touch upon what I know and, and comfortable sharing at this stage. And she does have a website which is was listed on those slides. Um, we touched base about two, three, maybe four years ago now. And she first contacted me saying that she'd read Stitch Stories and she'd started this project and she'd call it 52 Stitch Stories. She'd seen a previous installation I had done called T Flora Tales. And she said, I kind of stole that idea of the little um, signature pieces where people could talk about place a garden they've been to flora they wanted to protect the tale they wanted to tell about it. and the idea that tea is a symbolic for me of getting together socially yeah where we get to talk about ideas so she wanted to do that for, with her community so that they in in the isle of Arran, so that they could tell their own stories but that kind of expanded during the lockdown and because we've had that narrative so if people come to me and say i want to make a response one of the things I want to quite make quite clear, this project, what we miss, what we value, is something that I was passionate about. It's not funded. I'm not being paid to do it. I just put it out there and people have just responded. And that's how it should be sometimes. It's something I can do and feel feel it's right for me to do. So this is what Fiona is doing with her community. Now, she does do um, paid projects, but... It's with those partnerships of people that I can see and screen in front of me at the moment, you know, Jean and Lisbeth and Robert and yourself at our space. And I look in the audience and I probably um, um, I've worked with um, some of the universities and colleges in Ireland. Is it by keeping that narrative going, by keeping that sense of community going, despite not because of cutbacks, is so it's really relevant because that gives us ownership over a voice that we can can be used for, a, a, for the power of good. And I think art does that. It gives, sometimes makes the intangible tangible and physical out there in the world and, and, and say that we can voice what we feel, even if we're not, you know, you don't have to be right. It's out there to be discussed. I don't believe I'm ever right. Sometimes I'm right, but it's there for discussion. And that's what arts can do. It opens up possibilities for discussion. And it's about how we see the world and how we can have our voice in the world. And that's what Fiona does. They're, they're interlocking voices. So the next question is from Ruth and it's, is the text all stitched or written with pen? Um, all of the text on those pieces is stitched and it was hand stitched while I, while I was traveling on trains, planes and buses. So that's the, all of the stitched on those pieces on the installation were stitched before I even thought about how I, so the first year and a half, I was stitching these fragments as I traveled with no idea of how I was going to bring them together. I just needed to do it. Rather like the little cups I made, I'd start with that little seed of an idea and I just needed to do it. So I didn't have an idea of how they would come together. That leads really beautifully into the next question, which is, do you do much prep before starting a piece? Or do you just start a piece and let it flow organically? A lifetime of preparation, but I don't, if it, I don't design in a formal sense. It's part of an ongoing creative process of, of which all of my sketchbooks or journals are part of that reflective process. So when I'm working sporadically, I'll note things down and I make drawings just, you know, I sat out in the garden this morning drawing for 10 minutes because I wanted to know it's bird watch week and my partner's going to be doing an hour of bird watching for the National Bird Watch. So these small incidences of my daily life sometimes just refloat within my work. So it's that kind of loose connection. Um, really, when you think about it, I've become much more connected with that, with my understanding of what's happening with my, my partner's brain, how amazing our brain is and how he's seeing the world slightly differently and how some of the things I'm doing are being questioned because of what 
I'm sharing with him. So I, I see there's possibilities coming out of where I am at the moment. So I'm learning, you know, my work is about what I learn, about my life, about the life I live. So the next question you've actually answered, and it is, uh, Maggie, do you use sketchbooks? Oh, no. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you don't you don't use sketchbooks, do you? Because <laughs> no, they're always I have variations. I've got my I've got I'll bring out one here, it's just above me. These are the ones that record. I mean, I just randomly, these are um I, I always use hardback ones, which are recording um proce processes and development of ideas in my work. So you know, this is actually 2000 and I know by looking at it, they bring me back to a particular time. That's the other thing. So this is me going through ideas that I'm for an installation in Rochester Cathedral in 2020. OK, so I was thinking of wrapping the pillars, but then I made a room that people could enter. So these there we are. So this <laughs> is me thinking. But again, with that piece, I started to make the panels or bits before I knew what I wanted to do with them. So it's always this kind of hopping. There's me developing or responding, and then how do I bring it together? So these are kind of, if you like, a working diary. And I can, when I pick up any of my sketchbooks, so let's just see if I've got one up here I can pull up. Because a lot of them allow down my studio. My, if I pick up the, these ones, they've got a spine on them so I can I never throw a page away but these will tie me back to a given time or place so let's see if I open up this randomly it's got a stitch in it 21st you, you, of August you've got hundreds you've got hundreds of cars haven't you um, where, where do you keep them um down the shed in the loft and above my studio um I would be hard pressed to know if there was a fire in the house I would now oh, make yeah. I did always say Derek could take care of himself but I would check he was out first now then it would then underneath my arm I'd have a sketchbook and everything else can just go because it's just stuff. Oh, the, the next question is from Ruth and she says uh, she asks, are the vessels made of paper? Paper, mostly paper, but there are fragments that were left over from the lace in those big pieces and some of the fine muslin. So they were the little bits that were snipped off or changed, tiny little bits. But yes, they're mostly paper. That's all the questions that have been put into the chat. So if anybody wants to turn the microphone on and ask Kaz a question directly. Please do. And I will um, be happy to. I might not see you. So um, if you would then call out the name, please. I love the way we're organically working with Zoom. If you call out the name for them to ask their question, because I'm. <laughs> and I'll, I'll probably spotlight them if I can find them, but. Hi, Cass. Um, it's Ruth here from Toronto. Hello, Ruth. Hi. I love your work. I've been watching it for a while. Um, I just wanted to know about the working of the freestanding pieces. Do you work on one, on both sides at the same time? Are you conscious of a right side or a wrong side or, or you just let everything show? That's a brilliant question. And um, sometimes in my workshops, I always say to, I get students to stitch from the back so they're not conscious of the mark coming on the front because that's the game's joy of textiles. I, and that kind of revealed itself to me quite early on when I was stitching and making wall hanging pieces. I often then turned, I looked, turned it over to finish off and thought, God, I like this bit, this side better than the other. So I just cut it out and turn it around to the front because I liked it because it's the subconscious side. So you should try that now and again. It's a really good trick because Maybe. we get, we want to control everything and occasionally you've got to insert serendipity and then respond back because we don't allow the back of our brain to work enough and that allows that to come through. Great, thank you. Great idea. Any, any other questions? I, I, I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Oh, hello, that's Jean. You always have a comment, Jean. Come on, then. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm going to keep... I'm gonna spotlight you so people can see your lovely face and you get embarrassed. I have to keep up with you and your comments, my friend. <laughs> um, listening to your program, it um, it's um, wonderful to see your passion. And I am just astonished about how you are able to collect um, 
concept and story and expose that in your work. And it's wonderful that art is so educational or, or so emotionally experiential with your work. I really admire that. And listening to you talk about your oil paint transfers, um, I just recently heard that someone said, um, art is problem solving. And I don't think I have ever seen anybody more than you find a way to problem solve in so many facets. And that's the gift of your work, I think. I don't think it's just, a, I, I, I've got to kind of take, reduce my head down a bit from that comment. <laughs> um, I don't know if it's, we say a gift of my, I think it's also more important that if you, you listen to the work, but the most important part of my work isn't, obviously the sketchbook's incredibly important, but it's something that's not easy to define. But if I look back on it, it's not any of the work, it's you and our space and Robert and all of the people who participate in my workshops, who through their connection with me have enabled that work to evolve and develop in a because we keep questioning. So that's the element within my work that I think is more the, really the most important thing. It's the, the narrative that you, you talked about. It's mm -hmm. the narrative that's conveyed through being of the world rather than locked away in a garret. Mm -hmm. Totally. Well, that's why my whole, you, you give um, your work so much more voice than anybody I ever know. Look at people who show you a piece and, and it's like what Robert said, oh, hum, ha, that's nice. <laughs> and then they move on. But your work invites um, exploration and getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the work because it's so rich. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's kind of, um, I, I can't say it enough. I said it before, you know, the, the, the people who've traveled, uh, even the local people, whatever, who've, who've come and spent time looking at your work, and the images, the feeling, the the the, the uh, text, whoever has touched them. BBC Radio Four. It's twelve minutes to one. Now the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at double o one five. There are warnings of gales in Viking, north of Sierra, Forties, Ford, Thames, Dover, White, Lundy, Irish Sea, Malin and Hebrides. The general synopsis at 1800. Low, southeast Fair Isle, 994. Expected north Viking, 998 by 1800 Saturday. High, just west of Fitzroy, 1026. Expected Fitzroy with little change by same time. The area forecast for the next 24 hours. Viking. Cyclonic 5 to 7, occasionally gale 8 at first. Squally showers, moderate or good. North Utsira, South Utsira. Southerly, veering southwesterly 5 to 7, occasionally gale 8 at first in North Utsira. Squally showers, moderate or good. 40s, Cromarty, 4, Tyne, Dogger. Southwest, veering west, 5 to 7, occasionally gale 8, 40s and 4th. Rain or squally showers, moderate or good, occasionally poor at 1st and 40s. Fisher, German Bight, Humber. West or southwest, 5 to 7, occasionally 4 at 1st. Rain or squally, thundery showers, good, occasionally poor. Thames, Dover, White. West or southwest, 5 to 7, Occasionally gale 8 at first. Showers, thundery at first in Thames. Good, occasionally cool at first in Thames. Portland, Plymouth. West, 5 to 7, decreasing 4 or 5. Showers, good. Biscay, northwesterly 4 or 5 at first in North. Otherwise variable 3 or 4. Mainly fair, good. Trafalgar, South Fitzroy. Northerly or northeasterly 5 to 7 but mainly four or five in southwest Fitzroy. Fair, mainly good.
North Fitzroy, so northwesterly, backing southwesterly, four or five, occasionally three at first, increasing six at times later. Showers, then rain or drizzle later, good, occasionally poor later. Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea. West, five to seven, occasionally gale eight at first, except Fastnet, then decreasing four at times. Showers, good. Shannon, west, backing south or southeast, five or six, decreasing three or four for a time. Rain later, good, occasionally poor later. Rockall, Malin, Hebrides, Bailey. West or northwest, five to seven, occasionally gale eight in Malin and Hebrides becoming variable four later in Rockall and Bailey. Showers, good, occasionally moderate. Fair Isle, Pharaohs. Cyclonic, becoming north or northwest, four or five, increasing six at times. Showers, occasionally squally or thundery, good, occasionally poor. Southeast Iceland, northerly five to seven, backing southwesterly four or five in west. Showers, squally at first, good, occasionally poor. Now on to the weather reports from coastal stations for 2300. Tyree Automatic. Northwest by west, 5, 11 miles, 1005, rising more slowly. Stornoway. West by north, 4, 12 miles, 1000, rising more slowly. Lerwick. East by south, 1, 7 miles, 995, falling slowly. Wick Automatic. West by north, 5, 14 miles, 997, rising slowly. Aberdeen, west southwest, 3, 999, rising more slowly. Lookers, west southwest, 3, 16 miles, 1001, rising slowly. Boomer, southwest, 4, 24 miles, 1003, rising slowly. Bridlington, Southwest by west, 3, 1007, rising slowly. Sandetti light vessel automatic. Southwest by west, 7, 11 miles, 1012, now falling. Greenwich light vessel automatic. Southwest, 7, 11 miles, 1015, rising slowly. That completes the shipping bulletin, and it's the end of Friday night on Radio 4. Good night.